Welcome to this House of Books. We have a live event here today uh, to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the novel Why I Love Singlehood. We have with us uh, author Elisa Lorello. Elisa has been a writer and teacher for all her life. Uh, she's studied psychology in college and her novels are based uh, are, are about relationships. Uh, they're influenced, the dialogue's influenced by Nora Ephron and Aaron Sorkin. She's also written a book about the craft of storytelling, writing process, and rhetoric. All of her writing is infused with enthusiasm and humor. Lisa taught rhetoric and writing at college level for more than 10 years. In 2012, she became a full-time novelist. By now, Lisa is the author of 13 books, including the best-selling Faking It, and one memoir, Friends of Mine, 30 Years in the Life of a Duran Duran Fan. Sarah Garrell is, uh, fell in love with writing when she was in kindergarten and has never stopped. She has a background in art history, writing, and rhetoric. A native Vermonter, Sarah is a chiropractor and small business owner. She enjoys photography, travel, pretending she knows how to garden, and daydreaming about having enough time for any of these hobbies. Why I Love Singlehood is her first novel, but hopefully not her last. Now, neither of the writers of Why I Love Singlehood is single. Elisa is married <laughs> to best-selling author Craig Lancaster. They moved to Montana in 2016, and Montana is delighted to claim them both. Sarah is married and is the mother of two martial artist sons. <laughs> Sarah and Elisa met in college in Massachusetts about 20 years ago. They share a love of good storytelling, great cider donuts, and guys who wear flannel shirts. <laughs> they hope to collaborate again in the near future. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. I want to show the covers of these books. Um, Do you know I didn't bring one in with me? <laughs> I have oh I have the cover oh right God. here. Thank, thank you. <laughs> that was a little oversight on my part. <laughs> okay, you I can all see that. Go. There's why yep. I love singlehood. Okay, so this is the book we'll be talking about. Here's the other cover I wanted to show you. Uh, yeah. In the 10 years of why I Love Singlehood, in 10 years, Why I Love Singlehood has sold over 50,000 copies internationally, hit numerous bestseller lists, including number one in Germany, and has won the hearts of male and female readers alike. So the German edition came out in May four, on May 14, 2013. So delighted to have you both here. I'm, Thank you. I'm just real happy. My, uh, I'm going to MC this, but uh, I think my main task is just to get out of your way. <laughs> so, so tell us about the book. What do, what do we have here? Who would like to start, you or me, Sarah? Go for it. Let's hear it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so we actually remember this story differently. <laughs> Um, at the time, now this is going back actually to around 2007, and I was living in North Carolina, and you were living in upstate New York, if oh, I wow. recall. Yep. And so we, we both had private blogs, and so we were reading each other's blogs quite a bit and absorbing it, and I had, um, I had written... I was very single at the time, and I had written a very similar kind of Why I Love Singlehood inaugural blog post just celebrating my singlehood. And I kind of sent it to this guy that I liked, and he said, oh, I'm glad you feel that way. By the way, I have a girlfriend. And and I imploded. <laughs> and and I think I think I wrote about this in the private blog, and here's where our memories are different. Um, <laughs> Sarah remembers this, or I should say, I remember this as Sarah saying, that is a great idea for a novel and I want to write it with you. And Sarah remembers it as, is it me saying, I have a great, great idea for a novel and you have no. to write it? What was it? <laughs> I remember saying, that's fantastic. You have to write this. And you were like, eh, I don't know. And I was like, you have to write it. And you said, only if you write it with me. Okay. Well, you are probably right. <laughs> <laughs> 
in terms of the memory of it. Um, so that's so so some and, and as 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 even as we said in the book, there are three versions of the truth: what you say, what I say, and what really happened. <laughs> <laughs> what did happen from there is that we started, it started as a joke and we were just kind of playfully sending scenes back and forth to each other. Oh, what if this happened? Oh, then what if this happened? And at first we were very much each other's audience and it was just for yes. us and this, just this fun little side project we did. And then at one point, Lisa kind of sent an email like, I think this is turning into something. <laughs> Yes, no, we are like, writing a novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, by the way, we're writing a novel. Um, so, and, and what was really interesting about this, and this is something that certainly I never did before, is we, we really did kind of wind up patchworking this novel together. We really didn't, I think I had kind of started from the begin, you know, with like a beginning chapter, and mm -hmm. then, you know, like a beginning of the story, I should say. But then we were writing scenes as they came to us. So it was, I'm in the mood for this. And then we would write this and then we would pass it back and forth to each other. And we would go through, I don't know, eight to 10 passes, I think. Mm -hmm. And just On really single scene rework it and and keep adding to it and I remember I don't think there was track changes at the time or there, there was we didn't use it but we color coded we cut co we color coded the typeface like we color coded the font so you to to indicate all the additions to you know how many oh. times we were adding to it now. so why come on come on he's bored well, welcome new people. Come on. Just mute, just mute yourself, please. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, we, we patch, we started writing, we would, we would switch these scenes back and forth with each other and, and, um, and color coded so we could see what the evolution was of each draft. So one draft would then have, you know, the latest draft would have like eight colors <laughs> of, of different, of, you know, different fonts. And then, and then we finally, when we felt satisfied with it, we moved to the next scene. So what's interesting, I, I, it's funny, I started reading it yesterday and I got, I'm, I'm about two thirds of the way through. Unfortunately, I didn't get to finish it before tonight, but, but I was really struck by, like there, there are definitely, places where I'm like, you definitely wrote that. But most of it is, who wrote that scene? Who wrote, what, what? you know, and, and kind of didn't, um, it's flawless in that sense. And I really, I'm really impressed with that, reading it now after all this time. So what are, that's, I think one of the questions we get a lot is how did you co-write? Did you go back and forth? Is it one chapter, one chapter? And and that has been hard to explain to people that in any given sentence, half the words were yours and half the words were mine because we did workshop it back and forth throughout the process. We edited and combed. And so, I mean, it was literally this word better. I like that word better as we went. And so there's there are there are certainly chapters that are more are predominantly Elisa, and there are sentences that are like, "Oh, that is so me." But <laughs> yeah. the, ma the majority of the novel is truly meshed together and yes, uh, very unique in that way. That I don't I don't think most co-authors do that. <laughs> no, because even when Craig and I wrote "You, Me, and Mr. Blue Sky," we were we were pretty much dominant with the chapters that we wrote. Mm -hmm. We we went in a little bit with each other's and polished some things or tightened or added or took something out but nothing like what you and i did well i mean you and i really did like I, that was a good word you used a meshing yeah. of it and you and i really really did that way our writing voices and styles are not that different if you were to just read something just solely you or solely me we're not that far off anyway but we just just did the same um just just worked it back and forth so much and to the question i think it would be a lot easier if we had something like google docs now or something where we could track those changes that would yeah. make it so much more streamlined it was um clunky at best <laughs> but, it, but at the same time it's fun i'm kind of glad oh, we yeah. 
did it that way. <laughs> I think in, um, in the end, we ended up doing some track changes and then decided that we kind of liked our system better because it was, it was fun. It was meant to be fun. It was definitely fun. And we had great comments and to each other. Um, cause, yeah. cause also, like I said, we were doing this all long distance. We did not get into a room together until I think it was 2010, as a matter of fact. Um, yeah. Um, it, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think we were only in the same room twice during the writing process. I came yes. out to New York once. Yeah, like we met at my mom's. Yeah, we did the, one week there. For the mid, that was our midpoint. Thanks, mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and stayed there for a week and we worked. I mean, we put in 40 hours and we were literally, we both had binders and we would literally start from page one. What are your comments on page one? What are my comments on page one? And I also remember we did a lot of compromise where yeah. we would say, if you let me keep this line, I'll let you keep this line. Or if you let me delete this line, I'll, you know, I'll let you delete this line. But, and again, this is what's funny I, in reading the book now, because like I said, I haven't read it in a while. So to reread it now is, it was really delightful. And I, if you told me now, well, what, what did you delete or what did you keep or what were you bargaining? I have no recollection no of what we were fussing over, but we did but fuss. Editing process go a lot easier because we had been, I mean, obviously we needed an editor, but we had combed that book so tightly. And yes. every, if you wanted to keep something down to the word, you had to explain and argue <laughs> why you thought that your word was better than the other person's word. And not in a mean way, but in like a loving, joyful, like, oh, tell me why we should use whatever oh, word. We geeked <laughs> out on that. Yeah, we were totally geeking out on oh, the yeah. make your case for this word or make your case right. for this <laughs> sentence or yeah. That was why fun too. Scene, why is that character making this decision? And everything was very critically thought about. And so then when it was time to edit, you know, there was some timeline consistency and um, details like that. There was some wordiness, but most of it was pretty tight already because we had done this working. Yeah. And that's also something I don't do in my process. I, I, my process is, when I'm working alone, my process is typically bang out a first draft. It's very messy. It's very unpolished. And then I go back and start getting very meticulous, but I don't do it one scene at a time. I, I work through the entire draft mm -hmm. and then, and then I, I go through it. Erica is asking, what is one of your favorite dialogues in the book? Um, and, and that's funny that you said that, Erica, because that was the other thing I noticed while I was reading, and I'm like, man, the dialogue's really good. <laughs> so, what's a favorite dialogue? Um, man, anything with Ava and Norman is so good. Um, yes. All of the nervous, snide little one-liners are like, I think that's the thing about this book is I don't, I love, there's the, one of the critiques we got is there's so many people in the book, but that's what I love about it. It's that conversation that happens and, you know, the grounds just has great dialogue back and forth. Yes. I, I love it too. I, I've, I've really been enjoying being back in that coffee shop. It's like, <laughs> I, I found I missed it and, and yeah and have been really enjoying listening in on all those conversations again. I, you know, I, I got, to, I can't remember which chapter it was in now, but I remember I wrote a scene or I wrote a, a, a thing of dialogue where they're saying, um, one of them says, nothing, there's nothing good on since Sex and the City and The Sopranos went off the air and then they're having this whole, you know, um, I, it, was, it was strictly for my own, for my own little delight of like, um, uh, well, the West Wing is still good. Well, who wrote the West Wing? Well, he wrote the same guy who wrote A Few Good Men. Wait, I know who that is. He wrote Sports Night. <laughs> I just, like, and there was no point <laughs> really to that bit of dialogue being there. Uh, and that might have been one of the things we <laughs> we negotiated. Yeah. It's like, please let me keep my little Aaron Sorkin thing. In there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, yeah, that that always made me laugh. That and and so when I read it again, I said, oh, I remember that. 
I got a, I got a little kick out of it, but there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of good dialogue scenes to choose from. I don't, I mean, that one stood out, but I don't really, like you said, there were a lot, there was a lot of good dialogue between Ava and Norman. There was a lot of good dialogue between Minerva and Ava. It just, you know, just the interlocking of all yeah. the characters and all of their relationships. Um, I got to the scene too where Norman had upset Minerva and he makes peace with her by like waving a little white nap he makes a little napkin flag on a that's, straw that's actually true that piece is true i had gotten a wicked <laughs> fight with a dear friend of mine who was living with us at the time and i take a napkin to a wooden spoon and like <laughs> <laughs> and it made her laugh so hard that we forgot what we were fighting about so that part is actually true <laughs> see you always gotta at nora efron everything is copy you gotta use what you can um yeah so that that was fun so um so we we wrote down some other questions to ask mm -hmm. each other if nobody else asks questions um what it's obviously it's 10 years 10 years gone by reading it now i mean uh, you were married at the time that we wrote it and you were pretty much a newlywed i mean i think you'd mm -hmm. only been married you and jim had only been married for about a year so at most but now you've got two kids and a house and a career and you're you're just full full on adulting now <laughs> as am i um you know because i i'm i'm married now so do you look at it differently now do you look at it more nostalgically do you what's your what's your take on it now the nostalgia i have is all just for the writing process and good coffee shops that's it i mean yeah. there's a shortage of good coffee shops around here that's just covid but um yeah i i don't because it, it because it's more about a mindset than a relationship status and so to yeah. me it doesn't that doesn't matter and that was a big part of it as i was writing and i did i did get the question of like oh but you're married and you're talking about being single like you know, I could write a book about being a serial killer. Would you question <laughs> then? Like, well, that, I was just about to say that's my that's always my favorite Alan Alda interview is when somebody yes. when he was on the West Wing and somebody interviewed him and said, "How well, how did it feel to play a Republican?" And he's like, "Nobody asks me how it feels to play a serial killer, and I've played them too." <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so I did, I did get a little bit of that, and so it was definitely a, a, something I was really aware of writing, and and I've always loved that. Alan Alda quote because it just sums it up perfectly but yeah. the way that I kind of rectified it in the at the time was that it isn't about the relationship it's about your your mind and yourself and yes. so that part hasn't really changed for me yeah I looking at it now it feels what it does feel to me now is very very 30 something it's meaning very, of that age time because we you know, I certainly was. Um, although we, it was in development for a web series for a time. And um, uh, she decided to make it, um, or they decided to, to make Ava a little bit younger. I think they made her in her mid 20s early to mid twenties. I'm trying to remember. Oh, now. they did. You're right. They did. They and, and I actually liked that. And they were trying to appeal to that kind of 18 to 24 audience. And what they did with that, that adaptation I thought had worked really well. So if they, and I don't remember how, because obviously blog blogging isn't really a thing now. I don't remember if she was doing it like a video Instagram or something. I'm not sure. I don't remember how she was handling the blog aspect of it right. but she had she had really really good ideas with it um so they they were doing a really good job so we have some other questions, some good questions. yeah so um, how did you create that coffee shop the regulars were the food were there particular coffee shops you kept in mind we're both nodding were there parts <laughs> about this that you both had to convince each other you drew a floor plan <laughs> I did. Because we, so first of all I think it was based on the coffee shop near um, UMass. Yes, which was Uncle John's that then later became Mirasol's. Yes. Um, but my, I was always more uh, Uncle John's than Mirasol's, so my vision was more of an Uncle John's. 
coffee shop. And then because there were two of us, we had to be really clear on what happened where and literally had to <laughs> know where the tables were and the walls were because, because we weren't in each other's minds to see that visual. Yeah. Um, so it was loosely based on this coffee shop near campus where um, it wasn't like a lot of students went there, actually. It was a very calm coffee shop. Not until um, it became Mirasols, then it became packed. Um, but waited. yeah, when, <laughs> when, but it, that, this is after you, after you had left and moved on. But yeah, but when it was Uncle John's, it was way more, it wasn't really a student Hang out. Yeah, it wasn't a student place. It was just this really great shop. And then most of the food was just stuff that we wanted to eat. It was like, you know what I really could go for today? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I wanted would be what I would write about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we did actually send each other recipes from time to time. Um, yes. But most of that was like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. And there wasn't much argument there. <laughs> by, by the way, I have a pumpkin muffin, a pumpkin chocolate chip muffin that I made. I today. have homemade Oreos from the bakery. Oh house. god, they are so amazingly good. <laughs> They're really good. But but yeah, that so we just it was there really was a lot of fantasy playing for me anyway, personal daydreaming of if I could own a coffee shop without having the responsibilities of I'm actually owning a coffee, coffee shop. shop what kind of coffee shop would I want and, it, I used and to, at the time that I wrote this I was in my first year of chiropractic school school yes um which is course for course the same as medical school except that we don't do pharmacology we do more embryology and neurology um so it's really intense and I would tell my friends that anytime I had a bad day I'd be like that's it I'm quitting, I'm gonna go open a coffee shop. Knowing that that's actually a really grueling, awful, hard job. <laughs> but in my mind, again, there was this idea of like this escapism and this fantasy of, again, where would I want to be? Who would I, what friends would I want there? I would want this banter. I would want that food. I would want this comfort, this feeling of home. And that was the space that we created that I Yeah, I we really romanticized it, yeah. Yeah, oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah. In fact, I had a friend who had owned a coffee shop and she goes, you know, it's nothing like it's this. It's nothing like that. And yeah. I was like, I really don't want to know. <laughs> don't, don't burst my bubble, please. Don't tell me. <laughs> yeah, I really don't know. I need my, need my little dream. And I'll also at the time, if you recall, I was watching a lot of Gilmore Girls at that time. Ooh, yeah. So there was very much, well, that was very much an ensemble cast that mm -hmm. was very much a the town was the star and that was very much about these small inviting places that you want to be in again has the kind of really back and forth quick dialogue yes that kind of wry dry humor so again that kind of plays in as well um and that kind of goes a little bit to chris's question about do authors um or their styles influence the way that we write it and um I think like you had said, there's there's a lot of like Aaron Sorkin and Nora Ephron style in there. But yeah, definitely we kind of drew from that same pace or the tempo of that dialogue. Um, yeah. It reads very quickly. And I think that, that we drew more from screen things like that where we could hear it than particular reading. Which is the really interesting thing about how I write. I tend to be very much more about the movie that's in my head when yeah. I write. So I do tend to, it's it, as much as I read, because <laughs> I do read a lot, but the influence is, oh, like I took a screenwriting class and the screenwriting class made, I felt made me a better storyteller and a better novelist I mean, than the short fiction class I took. Um, and and I do tend to even when I'm pitching my books, I tend to find the movie or the TV show or like, oh, it's a modern day Sleepless in Seattle or it's Sex in the City meets When Harry Met Sally for faking it or you know I try to find the the screen equivalent rather mm -hmm. than it's oh if you've read Jennifer Weiner then you would read this book or you know something right. like that. I tend to right. really. Um, relate more to the TV show or to the film or um, than to, but definitely other writers. I have to be careful about what I read when I'm writing um, because mm. I don't 
want certain influences to get in the way. So sometimes I really don't read a lot and other times I'm reading very, very specific things. Um, right, and right. Deliberately excluding other things. Um, is the potato restaurant a real place? Yes. And I, you have, say, you have to remember I know nothing about where it. I found out about it, but there was, and I, but I, it's so funny. I can't remember, but I heard about it. I heard about this place that it was just all based on potatoes. And I totally um, remember being, this was one that you had to sell me on. It was like a potato restaurant, like <laughs> something less romantic than a potato <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> but, but do you remember the original, that was the other funny thing, the original version of that, that date. <laughs> we, when I wrote, I think I wrote most of it, but, but when we reread it. a potato restaurant. <laughs> when we reread it, we were like, this is the most boring date ever. <laughs> It was abysmal. Oh my God, this date sucks. <laughs> we just, I can't feel like, oh, we, we have to fix this date, date with this guy. <laughs> yeah, it was a terrible, read, reading it, the first draft of the date was a terrible, terrible date. But yeah, I, I cannot remember, but there was something like a potato restaurant that I had read about or heard about or something somewhere. And I, and maybe it was like Food Network or something that there, like there was like diners, drives and dives or something. Oh, I think it was it, more but... obscure than that, Elisa, because I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I do think that that is something interesting is that sometimes the words that we would say to each other, like, could you get less romantic than a potato restaurant is the kind of back and forth dialogue that you would get, you know, that went in there going in that would actually be the reaction worked into the book. Well, I think there, well, I think there was some of that too. I think you and I had some dialogue with each right. other that wound up in Getting their into mouths. Um, you know, uh, in, it was like, oh, that's good. Write it down. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I have to take full responsibility for the potato restaurant and I don't know. <laughs> I really don't remember <laughs> what where it came from or where it was but uh, but it had I had to have seen something somewhere about it and I just modified it slightly um but you know million dollar idea some people <laughs> yeah, somebody take that and run with it because <laughs> and it's called the potato shack wasn't it did I name it the potato shack <laughs> It was not my favorite part. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I'll take, like I said, I will take full responsibility for that. Um, did we get the other question? Okay. I want to go there. Let's <laughs> see. I will, it's say, I will say, I was totally anti potato shack until I read it and I was like, okay, but that, I would totally eat that. That does actually sound really good though. And, and, you were the, and you introduced me to poutine, so which is all over Maine. Um, when I was living in Maine, I found a lot of it in Maine. But yeah, it was you who had to introduce me to it. And that was a conversation, I think, that between you and me that wound up in the book. A lot of that um, is straight between you and us. Straight, straight between the two of us. Yeah. So do you have a favorite or least favorite scene? I... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. And I honestly, I remember, I remember loving the lemon tort scene that you wrote, because that was you. That was all you. Um, and that was great. I remember that. I remember, well, it, it, you, you were the judge. It was my idea. That. It was my idea. Yeah. But well, that's one of my favorite scenes because I had this idea of, so that is based off, parts of it are based off of true events. And, and when I, when I, whenever I cook there, it's very, I end up thinking about whoever taught me that recipe. And I wanted to yes. capture that, that feel of every spice, every texture, every scent is a memory of a person. And so I had this idea and I wrote this scene. And then when we sat down in person at your mom's, we read it and it was horrendous. <laughs> it was well, the original, I, it needed, it definitely needed cleaning up. It made no but, sense. And we worked yeah. so hard and we almost scrapped that scene and we worked so hard to make it 
make sense to an outside reader. Yeah. In the end, it was incredibly well crafted. And so I love that scene because of that process that we went through. Um, and I think it ends up being a really strong scene. So that one is... Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have a least favorite scene. I think if there was one, we got rid of it. So I, I don't have a least favorite scene, but I... It's not a whole scene. I have one thing that still confuses me, which is, I think, entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> one of the key differences between you and I is that um, I grew up without a television. I, I have never owned a TV in my life. Um, and even now I don't watch a lot of TV. And so I miss a lot of pop culture references. And Elisa is kind of the antithesis. antithesis. She's like the- pop I had it all over that book, yeah. And so I remember to this day, like, I don't really know who Betty Boop is. Like, I know what she looks like. But like yeah. Does she go with Popeye? Does she have like a story? Does she talk? Or is she just a thing? And she, God, I, she's, know. yeah, that was, did, did yeah. I put, did I put her in there? Did Betty I put a Betty pen. Boop reference? The Betty Boop pen is supposed to be like a funny or meaningful gift. God, I don't no even idea. remember that. I, I haven't no gotten idea. to that scene yet in, oh, in rereading. Like, so, you know, so good. I'll look at it and I'll probably do the same thing. I'll probably read it and go, what was I thinking? Betty Boop. <laughs> and I, to this day, I'm like, or was it Betty Page? Was it a Betty Page pen? Maybe it was Betty Page. It was a Betty Boop pen. Either, well, we'll find out. <laughs> but yeah. I have our original, like. Oh my goodness. I think my mom has my copy of that. Yeah, and this that is was the one we wrote in, which is just like, it's got. Yes. All, oh my goodness. It's got writing all through it of all of our yes. process. Um, because we almost, and this is a good, this is a story to tell too, actually, if you don't mind my segueing into that, because how we got published, <laughs> um, we were pretty much getting set to do this ourselves, to publish it ourselves. And I had already published Faking It, self-published Faking It and Ordinary World, which are my first two books. And, and they were doing very well on the Kindle. Um, uh, which at that time, this was 2009, so the Kindle was really became the hot commodity. And, and so I had this really extraordinary run of success, especially with faking it. And so I figured, well, there's no reason not to self-publish Why I Love Singlehood. So we were already just, like you said, between the two of us, we were privately making these books for us to get the feel of what it will look like in a book and to get figure out what our cover design is going to look like and so on and then and then um and then in june of 2010 terry goodman oh you got all prepared <laughs> you came prepared i i i really i really yeah you have them all gosh i don't even know where my mine my i also have so many moves have some advanced reader copies too but go ahead terry so Terry Goodman contacted me in June of 2010 and Amazon publishing at that point was only Amazon Encore. And it was this, it was the equivalent of a small press. In fact, the way he courted us was, um, you know, it's the reverse Wizard of Oz where the, the, you know, the guy behind the curtain is the mammoth and the, you know, the, the person out front is the little guy. And, and so that's what Amazon Encore was. And he wanted to sign Faking It in Ordinary Worlds. And then he said, have you got anything else? And I was like, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I do. And, and so I think I sent him um part of why I love singlehood and said and he said well we want that too and then I called you and I said sit down and I said you were about to become the envy of millions of authors who just got a publishing deal without getting a literary agent first and you said holy crap please <laughs> <laughs> at first at first I I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, whatever. Like, I'll believe it when I see it kind of thing. Like, you know, it's like having a book option. Like, it yes. doesn't mean as much as you think it means. And so I was like, okay, sure, whatever. 
not a big deal. And then as you were explaining it, I was like, wait, but really? <laughs> and like, oh yeah, this is happening. Yeah. I still struggle. I still struggle a little bit when people ask me for help. They say, you know, oh, you're a published author. What advice do you have for me? And I have to explain to them that that's kind of like asking Cinderella how to get to the ball. Like she got there, yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't the way that most people go. And too. Yeah. I have a lot of help that I can give to people because I went from, you know, printing out a single copy on Lulu so that we could edit it to on it's the top done. of a wanky yeah. rooftop bar in New York City, sober and pregnant, just <laughs> surrounded by amazing writing big names with stars in my eyes going, wait, how did I get here? <laughs> and met my future husband there. <laughs> That's right. This is this very party is where Craig and I met. And in fact, you and I, after the party, said, "Don't know about that Lancaster." Don't know about guy. that guy. Don't know. About <laughs> that guy. Well, now we know. <laughs> I think I said something like, "I think I want to like him." <laughs> you do. Um, did you leave a lot of scenes on the cutting room floor, and was that a difficult process to get rid of things? I, I would think say we did, actually, which is really surprising. We didn't lose a lot of scenes. We, we lost, lost the kitten scene. There was oh, a kitten yeah. scene. All about the kitten. There was a kitten. It was okay. There was, there was a kitten scene that just was it, too much and very sad. blah. And yeah. yeah. No, it, it, we didn't end up cutting a lot. We cut um, pieces of scenes. We did yes. a lot of scenes that way. We lost a lot of dialogue if that dialogue we would read it back and forth and if it was not on tempo and clever we lost it and it, we performed it yeah yeah we would read it out loud back and forth to each other and i don't i don't remember it actually being a challenging process just because again it was that if you could sell it if you could convince the other person then mm -hmm. it would stay in i don't but, think holes it with the exception of that one kitten chapter I don't think anything really went on the cutting room floor, like whole sections, Absolutely. except the date that, like I said, that first date in the potato shack yeah. underwent a lot of a lot revision. Of work. <laughs> it just went under, it went, it went through a lot of revision, but it didn't get cut. It just, yeah. but we re reworked it a lot. Um, and that's more the experience we had was not so much that we cut a lot, but we just trimmed a lot um mm -hmm. and honed it and refined it and it was like sculpting you know um we yeah. kept shape shaping it and refining it until we got it exactly where we wanted it um what what was one thing that either of you really had to convince the other one about other than the potato shack again i don't remember i really don't remember do you I was um, trying to today as I was reading the book, I was trying to remember what did we negotiate? I remember a big one. Okay, so two things that I remember. Okay. One was the names. I I still like uh, some of the names I struggled with. Um, it was Nerva to be named. You um, did it? And I um a sister B still struggle with her. Just say sister B. Yeah. Okay trip on that one all the time so there were things and then some of them I thought were too cutesy yeah um, and so that was something that you had to convince me on and in the end I just didn't I didn't care as much as you did so yes. I was like oh, I if it makes you that happy but the big one that we had to convince each other on was how the book should end and who, not how should it end but which character like which leading male character really was going to take well, center. yes that yes. was big. that and I remember we had a big conversation about yeah you were like midway through you were like no I think we need to change like how this all goes down and I was like what <laughs> so, Kate you did you had a big you played a big role in getting rid of the kitten scene yes you did the kitten chapter you were like the kitten has to go I don't <laughs> want the kitten <laughs> I think I started the kitten but I it was yeah just, yeah we don't miss the kitten mm -hmm. um <laughs> and, and by the way just to clarify what we're talking about i think it was a character adopts a stray kitten or a stray kitten came into the grounds they found it behind the dumpster when they, they were found it behind the dumpster and, and like yeah 
sentiment. It did. It just didn't have a point there. Like it didn't advance the story. I think ultimately that's why we let it go. Is it just? It was not advancing the story at all. Um, do you have favorite characters, and if so, why? Uh, Norman, I I just absolutely adored him to pieces. He did. He did. And and we I think that was one of the things we went back and forth with. Is she gonna end up with Norman or is she gonna end up with Kenny? And yeah, we I think we knew it was gonna be one of those two. And we ultimately decided it was Kenny. My favorite was Minerva. Um selfishly. I think I saw a lot of myself in her, given that she was a little bit younger than Ava and she was married and um and I just, I liked that she was so snarky and I <laughs> resonated with that. Um, and a lot of her snarky one-liners were things I actually had said. It was dialogue that we picked from our conversations and got plunked in there. So she was always um, a favorite of mine, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I loved her too for that. Did you see the question, which character still, do you feel still has a story to tell or a place to go, if any? That's a great question. I... If I had to write, I don't think I would write a Will's sequel, but I, I might write a spinoff, and I think I might make it about Norman. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. And I don't know what his, but I don't know what his story is, especially, and, and would I start it 10 years later, or would I you know, write it during that particular time, or would it be a prequel, or I, I don't know, but I, I think he's, he's somebody I would say, what, what happened, or what's, or what, what's something in Norman's life that's going on that he, you know, wants to talk about. We've definitely been asked before about whether there would be a sequel, or anything like that, and I think that as much as I wish there was, I love this place and these people and this style so much. And again, it was, it, we wrote it for ourselves as this is the place we want to be. Um, that I wish that there was a, a Will's sequel. I, I want there to be more, but I really, I, like you, Elisa, I don't, I don't think there is. I don't think there's more to that story. I don't I think, I don't there's, think there's enough. Because I, yeah. I, I think every once in a while I do think about it. Like I think, for example, I think, well, it's almost like a where are they now question. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, Jay and Minerva definitely have kids. And if, if, and I wonder, okay, where is Ava at this point? Is she married? Mm -hmm. Is she, is she married to Kenny? Is there somebody else? I could almost see writing a wedding, like making the book, Once or twice. the book around the wedding. But even that, I wouldn't want that to be too tropey. Right. Chiclet, like I like, I like where it ended. We did, yeah. I did one time pretty early in my first son, I wrote you as if I were Minerva. I like sent you an email, like hold in the bathroom. And I was like, I'm yes. going to see it. I wrote this little email. Um, and so, yes, I, just to blow like off steam. Kind of yeah. Little snapshots, but I think it would be more of a, a spin off than, you know, or like, or something strange, like, Ava moves on and somebody new buys the grounds and, and yes. what, again, it's like the place is the character and yes. uh, what would happen then? What would that story be? That to me is um, enticing and interesting, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't see a direct sequel like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, nothing has come to the forefront enough to say, Right. we have to write it and that's really and that's that also goes to the question of would you ever collab you know will you collaborate again and it's when when the story comes and we right. both look at each other and say oh my god we have to write that and that's how this one came about was that we we had to we had to yeah write. we had to do it we and regardless because, of the way we were remembering it how it came about we both knew we had to do it because it was yeah. certainly, though it was fun, it was laborious and it was time consuming and it was not feasible to make a living writing this style because it took us years. To it write did. It. it took us three years. It took us almost three years to do it. Um, 
and and especially as a published you know once you once you are contracted with a publisher they're not waiting around for three years for you. (laughs) So, um, and, and I could even tell you now, I mean, I haven't had, you know, I haven't had anything else since January of 2019. And it's, it's a concern that it's been so long since I've released anything and, and how much longer are people going to wait? Um, so, um, don't, don't go on with the story. It allows readers to, well, and I love that too. It says the comment is, Chris says, don't, don't go on with the story. It allows the readers to have their own fantasy and make more stories for themselves. And I actually love when a book ends like that, yeah. where you take it yourself and figure it out, you know, or you can, or at your book club and, the, and at the book club, they're all telling each other where they think these, these characters are or what they should be doing or, um, so yeah. I, I, I do like that. Um, I really like these. Literally typing what Sarah just said, that the grounds changes hands. That might be interesting. And then, and yeah, and the book is about the grounds. It's not right. necessarily, or it's another book that takes place in there with a brand new owner and a brand new clientele right. because all of these people have moved on. Um, right. Would be interesting. Um, did um, you have any other ideas for the title? No. It was no. always why I love singlehood and it was always shortened to wills. Yeah. Always. We always and called I think it that. that came from your blog, your kind of original blog. Yes. Was that the one that I you might have even titled it that. I might have titled that original blog post why I love singlehood. And so that was it from day one. It was that. Yeah. Um yeah. and we had that, and then about midway through, I got the last line. I called you up, and I said, I know the last line of the book. It I remember to- that, and you did, and I said, oh, my God, that's great. And, yeah, and we, we did and it. That was, so those were, like, pillars. We knew we were starting yes. here and ending here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also like this question. What were your expectations of working with each other when you decided to start, and did they, good or bad, end up being true? Um, I certainly expected... Uh, So um, Mark had said that we met in college. The truth is that we did meet in college, um, but Elisa was my professor. (laughs) And so, and, and then, you know, like we click quickly moved out of that as I went through my four years. Um, But I was really uh, not intimidated. That's not the right word, but I was kind of expecting Elisa to take the more dominant role. She was already a published author very successfully. She was originally my professor. She knew what she was doing, right? And so I kind of thought like, oh, well, I'll just sort of be in the back seat, you know, she'll, it'll be her show though. And um, that wasn't the case at all. And I was really grateful for that, but kind of pleasantly surprised that that it, no, that's not how it happened. <laughs> no, it really was a partnership. And, yeah. and the only, the only thing I did, and I did it more, really, it was marketing, it was business, was I put my, the only reason why I put my name first Absolutely. was because I had more recognition at that you were point. Established. The, okay. And that was the only reason why I said my name should go first. It had nothing to do with ego. It had nothing to do with, you know, um, if we were on, in, in that sense, have we, had we been on equal footing that neither of us had ever been published before, I probably would have said, well, let's just do alphabetical order. And I would have gone with what sounded better. And I think yeah. Morello before Garel is better. <laughs> <laughs> Craig and I used to have that that very conversation when we were still friends of Lancaster before Lorello. And Lancaster before Lorello, it was alphabetical and it sounds better. <laughs> and yet when what I learned from wedding planning, and this is why eventually I might write a wedding novel because because I just think wedding planning is absurd. But but one thing I learned from wedding planning is the bride's name always goes first. So everything had to be Elisa and Craig, Elisa and Craig, Elisa and Craig. So it's oh oh we're here for the Lorella Lancaster wedding, you know. It but that was, just sounds terrible. So you can tell that they are not writers because that's not- <laughs> But that's where ego took over because now I'm like, well, yeah, it's Elisa and Craig. <laughs> yes, yeah, Lorello and, and Lancaster. What are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> we can continue. Mark says we can continue, but I wonder if you'd like to wrap up. So what? we're almost at nine. Well, does, 
if anybody else has questions, did we get to everybody's questions? Let me just make sure we, did. we didn't kind of accidentally leave them. anybody else. Um, I'm going to scroll up and just quickly. I tried to keep an eye on them as we went through. Okay. Um, tell me, please. Uh, we did that. Um, expectations of working with each other. Yes. Yeah. So, so, um, oh, thanks. Okay. Thanks, precious. Um, when I will, I will, I want to ask at least one more question. So I want to look through my list. While you look through your reading, I'm going to show, um, so not only do I have the original faking the, it. Oh my God, you've got the original faking it. I have the original, original faking it. Oh my God, yes. Which that the, was. It comes complete. This one is not signed, but it comes complete with a handwritten note, which makes fun of the fact that the font is so tiny in this book. This book yes. <laughs> because this, again, this was, this was public. like literally the very, very beginning of print on demand publishing. And it was lulu.com. And it was, I had to format it all myself. It, the cover design was obviously, as you could see, it was so, um, um, what's the word? amateur <laughs> you know? and it was all and you could do it it was like a one-stop shop you could do it all yourself oh, this um, is a fun fact i don't actually have our our finish but the yeah. um this cover design which was for our handwritten editing yes. we did um we were pretty adamant when we went to amazon this is a photo that i took um, and I said, said we wanted something like that for the cover yeah we did and we gave this to them and said we want something like this and they came back with a couple ideas and we decided pretty quickly that it was that's what we wanted but that was kind of a fun little thing that we yes had and they did they did a nice a nice thing um chris says i write nonfiction. do you have ideas and advice for getting more captivating ideas do you mean for getting more captivating nonfiction ideas or um yes oh yes <sighs> That's a hard question. It's, it's almost, I almost just say you have to, you have to, and it's almost the cheesy answer. It's you have to write what is inside of you and wants to come out. So if you've got, if you have an idea for, like, for example, for a memoir, um, I don't think you can necessarily just, I, I mean, in a first draft, you could just put it all out on the page and you could write about your entire life. But at some point, it's going to go out into the world and they're, and they're going to say, but why is your story more important than her story or this other person's story? And I think in, in a memoir, for example, then you have to contextualize it in some way. Um, I disagree. <laughs> do you really? Okay. You, you know, you, that's not true. I agree with everything that you're saying. I just, okay. But my the way I would approach it is completely different in that okay. um, I would approach it in not like why is your story more important, but how are you looking at something differently or saying something in a way that is different or unique? Like how I, I would say that too. I would I would absolutely say I would say that as well. What what makes this what makes this uniquely you or what makes this unique to you? I mean, I used to always kind of wonder that myself of what, what am I doing? What, why is somebody going to take a class with me as opposed to somebody else? If it's the same like introduction to writing class or something like that. And, and with, at, at the risk of sounding conceited, when I say this, it's, well, I'm teaching it. And, and I mean that in the, what I'm bringing to it, my experiences, my perspective, my way of looking at it is going to, to be different from the, from the other person's. It's not necessarily going to be better or worse, but it's going to be different. And it's going to come, you, you and I could both write about cider donuts, but you're going to have a completely different experience of it as a native Vermonter, as I am as a native Long Islander, or, you know, the story I'm going to tell about it is that we went and got cider donuts on our honeymoon. And the story you're going to tell about cider donuts has, is going to be something completely different. I was just going through some old boxes and I came across one of the textbooks that you had assigned to me that I liked so much that I kept this long. But 
it was that beautiful essay on the orange. And it's, yes. it's, it's an, a short nonfiction personal essay about oranges. And this is the thing. It's, it's, he's, he's just writing about an orange, but the way that he writes about it is a way that I had never thought of it before. And it involves all of these juicy details. And, <laughs> and that's what I love is that it made me look at it from a completely different point and of view. And that's, that's a great thing. That's another great piece of advice is to, to, to write it in a way that the other person says, I never thought about it. That yeah. Way. That's what I was trying to communicate is that yeah. I, it's that, Oh, I never, why have I never, that's so simple and so obvious and so true. And I've never had that thought before. I that mean, I love to see. with my, with my memoir, for example, I mean, I wrote, I thought I was writing about just Duran Duran in the eighties and being a fan during the eighties. And then I realized it was so much bigger than that. And there was so much more to it than that, but it was the lens through which I looked at everything else in my life. So I was look, but I was looking at relationships with my family and relationships with my friends and relationships with music. But I looked at it through the lens mm. of being a Duran Duran fan. And that made it different from me just writing about me um, and my life. So I hope that answered your question, Chris. Uh, obviously there's no one answer for that or there's no right, an right or wrong answer for that. Um, so, hey, that person looks familiar. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, I was going to ask one more, one more question. Um, although I think we, I think we got them all. I think we asked almost every, uh, almost every question. Oh, here's a good one. How has your writing, how has your writing style evolved? And if so, in what ways? Hey, Gus, um, what, how would you answer that? How has your writing style evolved? And if, and, or has your writing style evolved? And if so, in what ways? Not a great answer. I mean, honestly, in the, in the past 10 years, there hasn't been a lot of writing. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, there's, in the past 10 years, I uh, graduated chiropractic school. I uh, started a family. I opened a business. Um, there hasn't been a lot of writing. And so if it evolved, it evolved rust um, <laughs> and mildew. Uh, but it's, but it's still there. And I think it's still the, the humor is still um, the, the main thread in finding the humor and seeing things in that just different quirky way is still there. Um, but yeah, for me, it, it hasn't really evolved, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've gotten, I've gotten better. At least I, I think I have. Um, it's, I'm a little tighter than I was, I think. Um, I'm more, confident. This experience. I'm more confident. Yeah. I mean, like when I, I read faking it and then by the time I wrote faked out, which was like the companion novel to faking it and it's kind of the same story, but it was from Devin's point of view, technically speaking from the writing standpoint, from a craft standpoint, faked out is the better book. Hmm. Um, and just by that time, I was just a much, much better, more confident writer. I don't know if my style per se is, I, I, I just think I'm, um, confidence is probably the best. I just feel like I know more of what I'm doing, but, I, but that I can always get better at it. But I too feel very rusty. Um, I've been writing again lately and it's, it's hard. Um, in a way that it wasn't before and never, and I don't want to sound like I'm one of those people who, who believes it just comes out of the faucet. I, it was not that, but it was, um, it was fun work and it's like lately almost... it's work work. Um, and, and it's just that rusty feeling. I just feel rusty at it. And I feel like I'm finally getting my groove back and I'm reading a lot again. And, um, 
I'm sorry, I'm answering a question here. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's my, that's my answer to that in terms of evolved. When I see things from a unique angle and that is who you are not, when I see things from a unique angle and that is who you are not, what to do? Writing is seeing things from a unique angle. And oh, 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 okay. I'm sorry. Writing is uh, practice. And that's kind of, what I think what we're saying is like, yes. just like if you, you know, stopped using a muscle, it would, you know, atrophy a little and it would be sore building it back up, but it would come back. Yes. And yes. It is a practice. It's skill. It's like any form of art. There is some that flows and some that's work and, and you know, it's art. Yeah. And craft. I definitely feel the craft aspect of it. And I'm, and I feel like I'm, that's what I'm getting back to as I'm doing a little bit of writing. I am recrafting things. Um, so does anybody else have any, oh, now you can hear it. And we're, I think we're about to end. <laughs> Sorry, honey. So thank you. This was really cool to hear, but thank you. You can literally do I know. I know she can. I think I'll write a book. Here's, here's another thing. If you recall, at the book expo in the swanky hotel where I eventually met my future husband, you gave me the best damn adjustment ever. <laughs> like I'm like my jaw hasn't felt this good in, in years what did you do <laughs> and, you, and I really remember you just saying so you know like so do you want to get ready for the party do you want to, yeah can I just do one thing what can I adjust you <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying you use some kind of craft. Is it witchcraft? <laughs> it might be. There's a question about if the recording will be accessible, um, which I cannot answer. I'm assuming that it will be somewhere. Mark will be able to answer that. I will have it. We're going to, we're going to negotiate. Mark and I are going to figure that out. Um, okay. We will likely either get it on the This House of Books website, or I will put it on my personal website, alisalorello.com. And if you sign up for my mailing list, then you will be able to get that information or I'll just send the link to Sarah and Sarah will get it for you. And it looks like it's also going to be on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so yeah. much. Yes. Oh, YouTube. That would be even better to have it on YouTube and then I can link it to my YouTube page. So, so yeah. Excellent. So thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Guys. So thank you everybody who came. Thank you for everybody who's here. Um, thank Thanks. you everybody for your awesome questions. Erica, thank you for your questions. Um, this was a lot of fun and, and um, I'm hoping to be able to do some more of these. And here's cheers to, I'm gonna toast to Simon Lebon, um, <laughs> but cheers to I Love Singlehood. <gasps> Happy 10 years. Um, and, and here's to another 10 more of, and 10 after that and 10 after that <laughs> of success. So, so, and yeah, we had, we had a ton of fun. So thank you. Happy birthday to Simon Levon. Yeah, that's why, that's Ellie, you know, that's why I chose the Simon mug today. Uh, cause Simon Levon's birthday is coming soon. So, um, and he's not 10. Uh, and thank you, Mark. Yes, thank you. I want to, I do want to thank this house of books um, because they, they, and oh, 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 I forgot to say the most important thing of all for those who are still here. Um, if you have not ordered Why I Love Singlehood and you would like to, you can order it through this house of books and um, we will post links. Sarah will post a link on her page. I will post a link on mine. Um, that you can get it for you. You can use basically uh, this house of books. Let me let me give a little shout out to this house of books. This house of books is is um, is a co-op bookstore. So you've heard of co-op grocery stores and things like that. This is a cooperatively owned bookstore. Um, anybody can become a member. So you do not have to live in Billings, Montana to become a member of this bookstore. So anybody can buy shares 
um, and become a member slash owner of this bookstore. They are, they've been wonderful for the Billings community and the surrounding area. Thanks, Mark, for posting the link. Um, they've been wonderful uh, in, in this entire region for, for Montana authors and other authors alike and for its patrons and its readers. They're, they're very, very much care, they very much care about readers. Um, and, it's, and it's a real community store. Um, so what I wanted to do um, to support our indie stores and, and, and local businesses everywhere, um, because they, of course, as we know, are really being hit by this pandemic, I wanted to give some, some business to this house of books. So I wanted to offer you guys my membership discount, which is 10%. So if you order Why I Love Singlehood, you could get 10% off the book. So if you want to buy a Christmas present for somebody or a Hanukkah present for somebody or a birthday present for somebody, <laughs> um, makes a great gift uh so you can get it for 10 percent off through this house of books and like i said you don't have to be a montana resident my cousin on long island had a wonderful experience dealing with gus and and ordering some books from him um and it's also good for any of my titles so not only why i love singlehood but the faking it series uh craig's in my book <laughs> you mean mr blue sky um, my memoir, whatever it is that you are interested in reading, and we hope we are looking forward to the day we also put another one of Sarah's books in there. Um, <laughs> just putting that more out like there. <laughs> yeah, just putting that out there. No pressure. Um, but that is for you. So the so the the link is there in the chat, and again, we we'll, we will make sure that link goes into our social media, and that's good for I think we said forty eight hours. That um, that offer is going to be good. So if you're gonna if you do, for those of you who are in the future are going to be watching this in the replay, um, you will be able to have it for uh, have this discount for a limited time. And again, this is. Um, Buy a copy for yourself, buy a copy for somebody else, um, yep. and support a great gonna, bookstore. I'm going to bring in Gus now. He can, okay. he can explain how to get that 10% discount when you order through us. So uh, there's, a, there's a little workaround that we had to do, and I think maybe <laughs> Gus can begin to explain it. Okay. Uh, so uh, our website uh, connects directly to the inventory of uh, our distributor. So if they don't have something in stock at the moment, it says email or call for price. So um, uh, we have ordered stuff into the store that the distributor may not have. Anything that's available, all of all of Elise's books currently are at ten percent off. You can order any of her books uh, to get that discount right now. If it lists that price, it's available in the distributor. If it says email or call for uh, price, uh, you, you're welcome to do that. You can call us to let you know what the price is, but uh, we probably have those books in the store or getting them in the store. So the way that we can work it through the website is we'll send you to the donate button. You will donate the amount of the book at, at that 10% discount. And, and you if you need, uh, and we'll, so you'll, you'll we'll honor that price. Uh, we're gonna ship to you. Um, from the store, if we already have it, uh, or as soon as we get it, we will send it out to you. It's a weird thing, but if it, it, the website doesn't allow uh, transactions if there's not a book present, and it doesn't know what the store's inventory is. So uh, if it doesn't list a price, it says email or call, it means we probably have it in the store. So we'll use that donate button to uh, pay the store for the book, and we'll get it out to you. Um, Along with that, you'll also want to say, this is for this book, and this is who I am, and please send it to this address so that we can make sure to get it to the right person. Yes, or, and definitely mention, mention us and, and this event, and, and, yeah, yeah, uh, sure. and you'll get it. Yeah. Uh, or you can say, send it to a random address, and somebody will get a wonderful Halloween gift this year. <laughs> <laughs> so... And there's oh. a Halloween party scene in, in Wild of Singlehood. There is. That was so. probably right. And a Thanksgiving scene and a Christmas party. 
It goes it's for, it's for any book for all seasons. The book for so all seasons. It is. It is. It's the book for all seasons. It's like the Holiday Inn of books. So, <laughs> <laughs> favorite way to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you thank you again thank you this house of books thank you mark uh for getting this set up thank you gus for everything you do and and um and it was great to see you sarah <laughs> yeah i know I, we you you. Like, I know we're just you all can go we'll just stay and talk <laughs> I'm just writing. i got some paper right here <laughs> yeah yeah this, this was a this was a really fun event uh, you know really lively and great discussion i sure appreciate it so, thanks so much for uh, thank for you again everybody and all the effort you put into this so, so. our pleasure so yeah all right take okay. care everybody see you all soon yeah bye-bye <laughs>